you very much uh, for coming here. So, so, such a so great, great memory. Um, so, like, uh, in spite of those um, bad and cold weather, I'm glad and hold, hold the lecture about Marilyn Monroe here in Kawana Hotel where she stayed uh, on, uh, on her uh, honeymoon so, 70 years ago, 70 years ago. I don't, uh, enjoy the lecture. Oh. <laughs> well, thank you, Larry-san. <laughs> um, it's such a great honor to be here because, of course, Kawana has so much to do with the story of Joe and Marilyn. Uh, they were here part of honeymoon, mid-February, so almost exactly 70 years ago. And uh, it's just wonderful walking to do corners and wondering if they might have been in this room or danced in this room. And, of course, the omelet that she loves so much here that you can still have in the dining room. Um, so, I come here with a story that I hope you will find oh, not only interesting, but it's a very unique uh, interpretation, I think, of her place in Hollywood history, but also about their very short marriage. I don't know if you know that they were only married nine months. So, it was a very dramatic roller coaster ride for both. And they spent over three weeks in Japan. Um, and so, I will just break into that story. So, it's just it's almost it's 60 years since Marilyn passed away, 70 years since she was here on the honeymoon. And still, she is in the news all the time. She is angry. And I don't know if any of you read um, about um, Taylor Swift, who is the biggest selling artist in the world right now. She has 300 million followers. And her new boyfriend uh, is an American football player. So outside of American football fans, He's not that well known in the world, but I think he will be soon because Taylor Swift was just in Japan. She sold out Tokyo Dome four days in a row. And uh, I can't even remember what they thought her economic impact on Japan was in those four days. And then she took a private jet just to watch her boyfriend in the Super Bowl. Washington Post just came out and said um, they are the new Joe and Marilyn. So basically what they're saying, it's been 70 years that we've had a super celebrity couple this powerful. Um, I, I'm not saying this because I'm a Marilyn fan, but I actually think her boyfriend has a long ways to go to be half of that you know, global superpower couple. They are, I mean, if even one of the partner has 300 million followers, you are a global superpower, yes. But Marilyn, as you will hopefully find, uh, in this short story I'm about to tell you, uh, just found a way. She was probably the first global superstar of the post-war period because hardly any entertainment was coming in at the time to Asia. And then she landed in even Japan, was surprised. Even her hosts, Yuri were completely uh, taken aback by how the nation reacted to her arrival. And unfortunately, um, in the process, I guess she sort of blitzed her husband because he really wanted to show her how much Japan uh, was an um, ardent followers of baseball and him you know, as a god of baseball. And, and he still was. He still was. And even then, Marilyn was able to steal his thunder. So, um, hopefully, this little short um, presentation will uh, give you some idea of how she got there. And um, let's just go to So I call it her transformational journey. But actually, the impact that she also had on the Japanese public, I think, was a breakthrough in some ways. Because it was still in the morass. The uh, economy hadn't really taken any traction. They got a little bit of boost from the conflict on the Korean Peninsula. So industry started uh, to reactivate, people were going back to the cities to work and so forth. But bear in mind, in 1954, when they came on this so-called honeymoon, every city that they visited was basically to promote baseball. Baseball was still the most popular game in Japan. And 
the public was, well, it was their number one sport by far, and in a very different way from sumo. It was the great passion and the great pastime. And Joe and Marilyn managed to combine the, the two greatest passions of the nation in 1954, um, which was film and, and um, baseball, of course. But in 1954, actually, baseball uh, ticket sales were floundering. And that's why Yomi Yuri know, was very happy to see Joe come back to try to get that back on track. And some of that was because um, this, things happened so quickly post war. 1947, uh, finally, Japan got a new constitution. And then, you know, a big part of that was Japan was going to take, take up arms again in perpetuity. And also, this uh, peace constitution um, that they were supposed to uphold. Um, but then, that was 47. And then the world started to collapse sort of around them when uh, the communists take over in China and then the, the conflict in Korea. And America thought, uh, okay, how are we going to protect the freedom of this region? And they, again, needed a very strong ally. And that was going to be Japan. So I think along the way, there were a lot of changing directions that might have confused the public. So U.S.-Japan relations on government level, policy level, it was actually very good. But the fact that Japanese fans were leaving um, professional baseball because they thought it was like an American hobby, and, but they were still passionate about high school baseball. So, so that was a very interesting comparison to look at the data around that time. And um, anyway, along the transformational journey. Marilyn always attributed her breakthrough in Hollywood to the Stars and Stripes. I think many of you know this is a military uh, paper distributed around the world. Um, and the Stars and Stripes had an annual Miss Cheesecake title that was given to their favorite pinup. In 1951, all those hundreds of thousands of young men in Korea were sending all the fan letters to Hollywood to Marilyn Monroe. And this really made an impact on the studio and the, the kind of movies that they then uh, pushed for her to appear in. So she always said she wanted to thank the boys in Korea. That was something she said in her memoirs, something she said in a lot of interviews. And so we'll come back to that a little bit later. And then prelude to romance, how did she meet um, Joe DiMaggio? Well, if you can recall two such famous people blind date. Um, Joe saw this photo in the magazine and he knew the baseball players that were doing the story. So of course, being Joe DiMaggio, he says, hey, just set me up a date and I'm on the And he did. But she appeared two hours late, so he was sure she wasn't going to show at all. And apparently he waited patiently. And when she appeared, um, he, was, he was just overwhelmed. He was happy. And Marilyn was just nervous because she had never seen him in a baseball game. Or she had no interest in baseball. And she was sure that he was going to talk about baseball all night and what would she do. But actually, when she sat down, Joe is usually not somebody that welcomes somebody to his table. But Mickey Mantle, who was a big star in his 40s and 50s, happened to be in the restaurant and came by and said, Mr. DiMaggio? John, I know every play, I know every game you've ever been in. And Marilyn thought, wow, now, uh, oh no, sorry, Mickey Rooney, not an actor. Mickey Rooney, who's the actor. And um, that really impressed Marilyn. That really impressed Marilyn, and, and she then found Joe actually so modest in comparison to her expectations of this baseball stuff that um, they got off to a kind of a soft start. And on the net, it was a bit of a roller coaster relationship, but we'll come back to that later. Now, as far as her career was concerned, 1953 was her best year yet. And she started the year with this mega hit, um, Niagara. And remember the Monroe Walk? And many people in Japan knew nothing about her except the Monroe Walk when she came in 1954. And it's so interesting because I um, have interviewed many people who uh, wrote the articles in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and everywhere they went, uh, hotel employees and uh, restaurant waiters and taxi drivers, they would all be asked if, if they said, 
guess what? I don't really know. I don't tell. And the first question they would always get, is the Monroe walk real? Does she really walk like that? And everybody was like, yes, amazing, isn't it? She walks like that. And so that was a question she got also at the, um, her interviews throughout the trip. But then came Gentleman Confirmed Bond. Of course, Jane Russell was a major star in 1953. Um, I guess Marilyn was still considered an up and coming stalwart. But she got virtually equal billing, and she was the one that was really bringing in the audiences to the theaters. So the studio did take note of that. But instead of thinking, okay, why don't we promote her more as a 20th Century Fox star, they wanted to keep her as um, one of the stable actresses, um, replaceable, on a very low weekly salary. And it is reported that Jane Russell was paid 10 times more than Marilyn um, for this movie. And Jane Russell, uh, apparently, well, she was very Christian. I, I didn't know that until I read about a few interviews. She was very Christian and she wanted to protect um, Marilyn. And it seems in every movie, Marilyn actually made quite good friends with the women she worked with. That, that was never a problem. And, um, you know, even Marilyn McCall, could be quite difficult, I think, judging the people, uh, said that there wasn't a main street in her. So, Marilyn McCall also felt very protected towards her. Um, but the, the writing joke was Jane Russell would invite Marilyn to the house for a Bible meetings, and she had lots of Christian friends who came to the house. And they were all just trying to be friendly, but of course invited her to church meetings. And, and Marilyn always told her friends that time, yes, she tried to put me on to Christ, and I tried to put her on to Freud, and it didn't work either way. Uh, okay, and there you have How to Marry a Millionaire. Now, there's a lot of funny stories associated with this in Japan, but um, so there you have another mega hit. And after this string of mega hits, Marilyn said to her company, Studio Fox, um, wouldn't, wouldn't it be possible to, I love comedy, but can't you give me some roles that I can really sink my teeth into? Um, I'd like to try some dramatic roles. I love comedy, but, you know, please let me have a variety of roles. And please give me a little bit more control over script. script. Yes. Anyway, they said, yes, of course. We know you're very talented, and we have just the vehicle for you. Please show up next week for the start of a production on A Girl in Pink Tights. And she said, that sounds really offensive. And they said, yeah, but it's your contract. Read your contract. You have to show up on set. And by the way, your co-star is Frank Sinatra. And of course, he was giving 10 times more than But she didn't show up. So uh, Fox promptly suspended her. And so somebody jumped the gun, and you know, articles like this appeared because I guess 20th Century Fox said this was going to be her next vehicle. Well, she never showed up on set. And then, almost exact same time, so she's now a suspended actress with no work. And then Playboy magazine comes out, like within a few days of each other. And Playboy was also out of the blue because Hugh Hefner had no money. He didn't even put an issue date on his magazine because he didn't know if there was going to be a second issue, and he was just going to keep reprinting this because he knew he could sell with Marilyn on the new center. So Marilyn was also the first keyboard in London, I guess. And she did get a penny for this because this was from her poor modeling days. Anyway, uh, 20th century was, you know, she said, okay, look what we've done again, you know. So you go talk to the press, you go explain your situation. And they didn't give her much help at all. So Joe said, hey, Marilyn, you know, these, these people in Japan, my handlers, they've been asking me to come to Japan, so why don't we get married and just get away from this? Why don't we just walk away from Hollywood for a while? And actually, neither of them were thinking that much past that moment. And then she said, yeah, why not? Because he'd been proposing for a long time. So, uh, they got married, but what? Well, Joe wanted a lavish wedding. Had it been the first wedding for 
old, it would have been the wedding of the century. But Joe forgot that he's Catholic, as you can get his family ones. And he comes from a Sicilian mother and father, straight from Sicily, he hardly spoke any English, nine kids, and mother went to church every day, that kind of Roman Catholic family. And of course, they grew up near the beautiful church in San Francisco called Saints Peter and Paul. So he went back to his church where he had his first wedding, and it was the biggest wedding ever in San Francisco. And uh, the priest said, but Joe, you have a wife, you know, and we have your photo with your wife in this church. You can't get married. And furthermore, if you marry somebody else, you'll be excommunicated. So apparently, he got very upset and stormed out. And so, of course, they had to go to City Hall, um, which was a little step down from the beautiful church wedding that he was hoping to have. And off they went on their honeymoon. Uh, but before they even got on the plane to Hawaii, um, Joe did make a stop and they just jumped in his car, went to a motel, six dollars a night. And he said, oh, all I need is a television. Just, just give me any room with a television because I wanted to watch baseball. So this wasn't a very romantic honeymoon. But he says, don't worry, don't worry. We're going to be stopping in beautiful places when we go to Japan. So um, anyway, we got on that flight to Hawaii. Hawaii was a little bit of a surprise. In those days, you had to have a stopover somewhere to come to Japan. Bit of a surprise because um, even the, the handlers and the agents in um, Hawaii were surprised how aggressive the fans were at the, at the um, airport. And so many celebrities had come to Hawaii before. They'd never seen anything like it. Marilyn was very frightened because they were actually pulling her hair and her necklace and things like that. So, um, but, but then the agent said, don't, don't worry because Japan is much more serious and they're much more about um, baseball. So don't worry, Marilyn will have her break from, from all this media and fan attention. She'll, she'll have a nice break in Japan. Well, were they ever wrong? <laughs> So this is um, Haneda, 1954, and um, you know, just as, as an extension of everything associated with Marilyn, was received so much publicity in 1954 as it still seems to do today. And this was a, a new uh, aircraft called the Stratocruiser. Apparently, uh, model number B29, right? Original. But anyway, this was supposed to be the luxury hotel in the air, as they called it, and Pan America was very uh, proud of it. And of course, Julie Marilyn traveled on it, and they got all this publicity free. I don't think any agent would have allowed that kind of publicity to circulate today. Okay, so, anyway. And Haneda itself, okay, one of the problems, they were hit by a mob scene, and I'm sure many of you have already read about this, it was a complete um, unexpected pandemonium uh, at the airport because there weren't really any uh, barriers to speak of, so there was a, a flimsy fence that the thousands of fans immediately broke through. And um, actually, there wasn't even a real terminal to speak of because it had just been retrained by the US uh, military forces that were using the runways, and literally just months before it had been returned to the Japanese government. Japanese government had no budget to build anything at the time, so it didn't ha uh, I don't think the terminal happened until the next year um, after their arrival. Um, so in come thousands of people. Their flight was also five hours late. There were thousands of people lined up on the Ginza to welcome them with the American flags. And it was getting dark, and then word got around that, oh, the plane hadn't arrived yet. So of course, they started heading towards Hanida. And then the others started saying, oh, but they're supposed to be staying at um, the Imperial Hotel, so they started heading. So it was just massive confusion all over Tokyo. And uh, when they tried to disembark, just there was too much of a crowd already at the, the um, end of the runway, so they had to turn around, go back, and eventually escape from the luggage hatch in the back to a waiting car. And then they just, just skipped and went straight to the Imperial Hotel. That's how crazy it was. But what was most disturbing to 
the entourage, was that these were supposed to be all fans welcoming back Joe. Marilyn was the last minute addition. But all they could hear of the chanting was Monroe, Monroe. And Joe was not pleased. And uh, okay, he was with his mentor, Lefty O'Doul, who himself was a top major league star. And he had come with Babe Ruth in 1934, and after that, Japan asked him to help set up the professional league in Japan. So he is called the father of professional baseball in Japan, Lefty Odu, and he was the first foreigner to be enshrined in the Hall of Fame in Japan. So he was quite well known, and actually it was, it was said that the, um, uh, the Showa Emperor and the Crown Prince of Time were both big fans of, of Lefty. And Joe trusted him, and that's why I think he was um, so pliable and manageable on these long tours to Japan where he had to shake hands with so many fans. And he, I don't think anybody could have made him do that in the United States, unless, of course, Lefty in San Francisco was with him. Anyway, so there they are, arriving at Hanuda, already nightfall, and uh, Marilyn was not well and very tired. And from, but, um, yeah, just to say, so tourism was virtually non-existent in those days, so they didn't really have the facilities to uh, accommodate incoming. And there were currency restrictions on the Japanese, and so very difficult to get a visa to travel. So when there was hardly any um, traffic in either way, uh, the Americans were starting to trickle in. And the Japanese were very surprised that they, many of them, headed straight for the diet building. And they didn't realize that this was of such interest to foreigners. So they thought, oh, it's Americans are very serious about protecting democracy and principles and governments and all that. So they were really impressed. But it turns out that the interest came mostly from Godzilla. And what was that building that he knocked down? So it literally, in the age of tourism, it sort of became the Empire State Building, what King Kong did for New York, because the Empire State Building. Right? So anyway, that's just a short little history of the tourism. Now, here's another reason um, Marilyn was just beginning to come into her power and realizing that she really had some cards to do. And uh, this is the Japanese poster of How to Marry a Millionaire. Now, she didn't even know that there was a Fox office in Tokyo because Japan was becoming a very serious market. Ticket prices were still too low at the time, we were talking about 120 yen or something. Um, however, they knew the market was really growing and the numbers, the attendance was already through the roof. So, America was starting to um, bring in offices to Tokyo and it became regional headquarters for many of the multinationals, uh, including um, 20th Century Fox. So the Fox office in Tokyo knew she was suspended. She was suspended. She was still suspended for not showing up for Berlin pink tights. But Tokyo had to be very careful. They didn't want to upset Marilyn because just her being in Tokyo, Joe and Marilyn were headlines every day in virtually every single newspaper every town they visited. Okay, so, um, yes, Tokyo welcomed. Now, on their first night, they headed to uh, the Imperial Hotel, and as nobody warned them, there were thousands of people waiting for them, because, like I said, the flight was so delayed. And it was already quite late at night. They could barely get to the front, so the car just drove to the back, dropped them off um, by the kitchen, and they were whisked off to their suites. And the hotel management begged Marilyn to come up. <laughs> they did not say Joe and Marilyn, but still the crowd was chanting, Marilyn, Marilyn. Yeah. I, I don't, if it's, if this is all true, if it's, if it's written in the newspaper articles in Japanese, if it's all true, how could they be so insensitive to the poor husband of his honeymoon? <laughs> and all the people want to see his, his bride. So, anyway, um, so Marilyn is now, you can see very small in the middle. So she did come out and wave 
And then everybody was happy, and then we walked back into the night. But um, here's another picture. This is the driveway. This is the driveway, and the big, these people went through the pond. There was a little fountain that would come in the driveway. And then there's this roof, and they climbed onto the roof over, over the, the driveway. It, it really was quite a scene. And the photos, even now, are quite unbelievable that this happened in downtown Tokyo. And uh, next day, next day there's a press conference, and it's actually uh, hosted um, by the Tokyo hosts. And it was for um, Joe DiMaggio. But you can, as you can see, Marilyn's on one side just trying to get to mirror and the good wife and away from the spotlight. And of course, the cameras were not, were not even interested in the side of Joe was sitting. And that didn't go over too well either. And she was getting very dumb questions. Is it true? Um, you walk, the mom will walk because something is wrong with your legs or something. And she says, no. I go on my life and I have no problems. Um, okay. <coughs> but before we write, but before we rank Joe off completely, uh, back to why was Japan I'm so passionate about baseball? And so for the US government, this was a cornerstone of US Japan diplomacy. So they really, really had to bring the public back to professional baseball. And this is a photo of uh, Joe and Lefty when they visited Tokyo in 1951. So Joe was here with the All-Stars. And um, that's General MacArthur. General MacArthur called uh, Lefty O'Doul the best um, ambassador America ever had. <coughs> and in a way, it was true because it was common grounds. It was a common passion that Japan shared with America. And Japan thought of America as its benefactors because of their passion for baseball. Well, many other things, but. Baseball was a very important part of what they called the diamond diplomacy. But um, I, I credit um, Masao Kashiki. Many of you would know Masao Kashiki because he was the uh, Meiji era's uh, most well known and very talented tanka um, poet. But also, he was a very well known writer, so he wrote in newspaper columns. He, he was everywhere, and he was an editor to very famous writers at the time, and good friends with um, Natsume Soseki and other prominent um, authors in Japan. But he went to Ichiko. Ichiko is, is kind of a predecessor or a future school, uh, but it's now a Toda. So back, back then, it was um, one step short of university, but they also had students who were 20, 21, so it's very difficult to say high school or university. But anyway, he was. A catcher, and so he was very enthusiastic. But in those days, there were hardly any teams, and they had very little competition or any other team to play with. So, what happened? A very famous a series of games took place in 1896, and overnight, Japan, when the first game in that series started, hardly anybody knew what Yaku was or baseball. Can be them or be, and they had no interest. Well, what happened was each club kept challenging the Yokohama Country Athletic Club. I think I have some friends here from the Yokohama Country Athletic Club. 1896, YCAC finally said, okay, let's, let's have a game. And they were beaten so badly. <laughs> it was hilarious. I, YCAC is more known for cricket and rugby than British sports, but they did have a few Americans and then they had a few Europeans who played. But when their uh, military officers were out at sea, they hardly had any decent players. So that was part of the reason that they lost like 26 to 1 or something disastrous like that. And there was hardly a mention, some sports column might have given them three or four sentences that day because baseball was unknown to 90% of the public. But by game three, this Masao Kashiki went and wrote article after article about how wonderful the sport is, and this is the kind of team sport that Japan really needed, you know, to nurture, to nurture spirit and teamwork and dedication and everything else. And he won them over by game three. Well, by the way, West Asia lost game two as well. And then in game three, 10,000 people went to the Ichiko grounds. And on the way, um, the, the reporters heard questions like, so what's baseball? And they said, we don't know, but we defeated the world in this sport. We have to go see it. And honestly, it became the most
most popular sport just immediately. And game four finally a mixed team, YCAC, finally one of their players came back from sea. So I don't think it was a very high caliber of games. And YCAC wasn't that embarrassed losing. They didn't think they would lose so badly. But finally on July 4th, the fourth match, they were able to win a game. And this is uh, known as the 1896 incident. I mean, it was by day of match four, it was national news because they, they now had something that they could compete with the world and they didn't know until this point. Similar kind of thing you know, happened with Ricky Dozon. Do you, um, I'm sure many in the audience will know, but Ricky Dozon was the most popular uh, professional wrestler in an era when professional wrestling was the most uh, prominent sport on television. And he, uh, he was one of the first to take it onto television, but also it was all scripted. And uh, always the, the gaijin, they had big gaijin actors that came in and Ricky Dozen would just go over and out of the way. And it, it really encouraged the Japanese, you know, having just lost the war and everything. It was fun entertainment and it was like, wow, see, we can be, be much bigger people. And, you know. uh, but um, it, was, it was quite similar. And of course, at the time, the public didn't know that Ricky Dozen actually was Korean. But, Asian defeating white people at the same time on television. Uh, so anyway, that's why Japan was so passionate. Really, 1896, that's when it started. And then, of course, Joe had to do his rounds. Um, Maryland did travel with him to most of the cities that hosted the baseball teams. But you have to remember, in terms of a romantic honeymoon or tourism, any city big enough to host a baseball team would have been uh, actually they would have been bombed pretty heavily during the war, and very few of them had recovered. So it was Fukuoka, it was Hiroshima, you know, to Tokyo. Uh, so what happened um, was that they took their most romantic spots. I would say that this was probably top of the list. This was their romantic thing. And when they went to Hiroshima, they went to um, Miyajima, which is also a lovely island. And uh, Marilyn went faithfully to the stadiums until Joe got very annoyed that, of course, all the press attention was on her. And they're supposed to be there to watch the man by the fact. And even the players were more interested in her than <laughs> Joe approaching them. So, yeah, many things didn't go well, and many people on the ground were thinking, wow, is this marriage going to last? But they were trying. Instead, uh, Marilyn then went around to a lot of military hospitals, and there were still a lot of injured. Um, even though the war in Korea had ended, there were a lot of injured still left in the hospitals. Okay. And here we come midway through the trip to the Toronto Hotel, and the armor that she loved. And immediately everybody in Japan read about it in the newspapers and wanted to taste this armor. But that's, that's how big they were. Everything they said, everything they touched, everything. So, here we are. Then. And this is um, just a village, just um, about half a mile from here, uh, seaside. And Joe. Marilyn decided to take a walk down there. And look how relaxed Joe looks. I, mean, I wasn't even looking to compare because I wouldn't have really known until somebody pointed out that there are very few pictures you would see of Marilyn with, no, Joe with fans looking so relaxed and happy. And, um, you know, holding hands with the children. And uh, I was able to interview Miss Iwasaki, it's the lady that has her head um, sort of against Joe's shoulder. And she still lives in the, the village of Kawana and uh, um, has very clear memories, but none of them, uh, they didn't have a movie theater nearby, so none of them had seen any Marilyn pictures. And um, they didn't know Joe DiMaggio either. And I think maybe Joe enjoyed that. But, um, but this Iwasaki-san that I interviewed, she said she had played um, softball in high school, and that's why she knew of Joe. 
So she could ask a few health intelligence questions. But she said, yeah, nobody in the village knew them. But we were very happy to welcome them. They were on their own. So, yeah. Very nice photos that they shared with us. Okay. And this is a picture of Marilyn and Joe and Lefty in Fukuoka. They went to a restaurant there that was only open for a couple of months before they arrived in Fukuoka. And of course, uh, only the very wealthy could afford the French food. And um, through the years, it was basically what the your household might serve when royalties and dignitaries came from overseas, and that was about the only occasion. But um, there was this new restaurant. Marilyn had, I don't think, had much um, knowledge of French food either. But she loved the French uh, onion gratin soup so much that instantly, within a week, everybody in Japan wanted to try French food. And, no, it, it was like that. <laughs> um, but, but it was so funny. And I'm wearing my black beret because everywhere, Marilyn, maybe because she didn't have time to fix her hair every day or something, but she was often in this black beret. And uh, in those days, um, you remember um, Tiza, Tezuka-sama, the very famous anime, um, Atom Boy, and some major Japanese classics. So he was always wearing it. And, um, and of course, it was Picasso. So in the Japanese mind, it was something that men were um, scholarly and artistic and of culture. But very few Japanese women were wearing it. And after this, uh, many Japanese women wanted to go out and wear a beret like that. And it was very interesting, 1954, so beret became very popular. But then her biggest uh, Hollywood rival came out of nowhere. Audrey Hepburn had already become a major hit in the United States because of her own holiday. It hadn't come to Japan yet in 1954, but it arrived just a few months later. And then it, it made the top 10 news. All the women with long, beautiful black hair that Japanese women were known for raced to get their hair cut off like the princess. Remember when she was in downtown Rome? So that became the fashion. So it went quickly from beret to very short Audrey Hepburn cut off his head. And Audrey Hepburn actually is the style icon in perpetuity. I, I don't think there was ever a contest. I don't think the Japanese public ever wanted to look like Marilyn or so cleavage like Marilyn in that era. But what I did hear from uh, a great actress and singer called Peggy Hayama, who actually had the privilege of meeting um, Marilyn and Joe. They were invited to the suite at the Imperial uh, because she spoke English, and so very few celebrities could speak English. So apparently they had tea in the suite. And Peggy said, you know, the Japanese treasured uh, white skin more than anything. So the women of Akita were always considered the most beautiful in Japan. And it was probably because they got the le least sunlight in and they really had translucent white skin. And Peggy said that um, Marilyn's skin was really the softest, whitest skin she had ever seen. And this is where a lot of people who met her commented, and that was very important for the Okay, and off she spent to prepare for her um, trip to Korea. And of course, she wasn't um, a, a bone fan at the time, but she did take course lessons and she already had a wonderful number in um, um, Diamond's uh, Girl's Best Friend. And, and, you know, <laughs> okay, so she had a voice coach and so she, she actually had a pretty nice voice and she did put out some recordings, but um, she had a very short rehearsal time in Osaka and imagine four young soldiers who were playing on bass, uh, just, just for the, the military, they were playing on bass, and they were like 19 to 21 years old. And imagine somebody coming in and saying, okay, boys, pack up, we're leaving in two days for Korea with Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> well, they came out with a couple of books. You know, they, they wrote this whole story about the trip, and, Oh, you can just imagine how it turned your lives on them. But, um, so they, she was rehearsing in Osaka. There's her band. It's actually the four boys that are sitting in the first row. That's, that's the band anything goes that travels through. And they wrote um, 
so many articles that were interviewed, and every time they said that, you know, she, she could have been sitting up front with the generals and the champagne, and she always came back and sat with them. And they were very impressed by things like that, so that's what's remembered. Her common touch, which showed very similar to how the press perceived uh, Lady Diana, that was her common touch. Okay, there she is. So she traveled uh, to 10 different locations, and she basically only had a repertoire of about five or six songs. But this is in 30 degrees Fahrenheit. It was very, very cold. And here she was, she had nothing, and she didn't bring anything uh, from the US because she wasn't expecting to go on stage. But this was her dream come true, and you can imagine it was a dream come true for the 100,000 soldiers that were lucky enough to see this. Yeah, look at that. And the men were all in their parkas and heavy snow boots. And here she is with her spaghetti straps. So she had a full on four days. She was being helicoptered from one side to another. And they said, okay, she did take a bit of time with makeup sometimes, but she, she didn't complain. She was always there, eager. And she always wanted to eat the soldiers in, in the cafeteria. But you know, this was her dream come true. So she said um, during the concert that she had never felt so confident and so close to her fans. Because of course, you know, she was um, known for her nervousness in front of the camera, constantly forgetting her lines, and uh, she was a nightmare for her co stars. But in this instance, you know, she never let them down. And so, with this trip over, they go back to New York. And by this time, so, so they left for this honeymoon, arrived in Tokyo February 1st. By the time she gets back to Hollywood, there is no more talk of the world being tight. She had, she had turned the tables on the box. And there was nothing they could do to touch the wife of Mr. America, for starters. And that she had proven her global extended far beyond the U.S. Um, borders to markets that were added to America. And, I mean, she could have really monetized this, but that wasn't where her mind was, and I don't think she ever had a management team that could have done it for her. But still, she was getting better managers now, and actually even Joe, who wanted her to retire from filmmaking, uh, and did uh, lend some of his advice and lawyers so that she knew exactly what she was talking about. But even while she was in Japan, her friends in New York were already talking to their lawyers, and they saw that the contract with 20th century was full of holes, and that if she challenged it, they probably wouldn't contest it. And that's exactly what happened. So instead of girl in pink tights, she conceded on a couple of things she really didn't want to do, River of No Return, I think, and the other one was No Business Like Show Business. So these were small concessions because then they promised her uh, the seven-year age, which was the biggest role she had. And you would think on the surface this is uh, another dumb blonde role. And we all thought she was tired of that. But this is different because it was a Broadway hit. And that gave it a lot of respectability and a lot of top actresses wanted that role. And I think that made all the difference to her. So, she conceded on the lesser movies she didn't want to make, and actually, there were small parts. Uh, River of Home Return was a major part, and full of problems, but um, she did, the box office did do very well on both. And then it was off to New York, and this is August. So, you know, you hear the clock ticking on their marriage, because um, they got married in January, and this is already August. And at first, Joe said, oh, I'm not going to go to New York in August. And he didn't like bumping into fans. Imagine that. So um, he said he was going to stay home. But then he flew in just in time to see her skirt flare up in the middle of Manhattan, time and time again to get the scene. And they never really got it right. So they had to reshoot it back in Hollywood anyway. But this went on for half the night. And Joe was absolutely livid because um, she was showing her underwear every time. Uh, and apparently he stormed off 
and rumor has it that they got into a very bad argument that night and he might have bruised her. And then a few weeks later, of course, she filed for divorce. And um, anyway, yeah, so this is August, and then when the film finished, and she went back to Hollywood, basically all of Hollywood welcomed her back and into you know, some other, an agent to her party. And at this party was Clark Gable, Lauren McCall, Humphrey Bogart, all, all of her, her um, the biggest stars she ever wanted to meet or act with were there to welcome her into their ranks. So this, she had all accomplished most of her basically talking to her new partners in New York and friends in Hollywood. And she was ready to check out Hollywood. And, and she did. After that party, I don't think anybody at the party, including her boss, uh, Donald Zavik, who was the president of 20th Century Fox, nobody saw it coming. And a few days later, she was on the plane with her new business partner to start Marilyn Monroe Productions in New York. And got a fantastic um, new contract for 20th Century. Said, okay, minimum so many films a year. And then you get a $100,000 bonus for this and this and this. And, but it was, it was just, just months before, Daryl Zanuck had called him the dumb blood, replaceable dumb blood. And he kept reminding her, any role you turn down, I can find one better actress to fill your shoes. And she said, try it. <laughs> and she won. That, that's an amazing turnaround. And had she not married Joe, had she not gone to Japan, had she not just walked out on her own two types, then I, I always say she would have still been on, on the ground in the nickel and dime battles with her boss. I had no respect for her. And breaking away to Tokyo just changed the entire universe and the new trajectory for her career. Okay. And so I, I call it Marilyn Triumphant because what she what she then accomplished in a very short time after that was truly impressive. Um, however, well, um, she just became an icon far beyond what anybody expected, certainly in 1954, but uh, they already knew she was a major star. Like I say, though, she didn't monetize on any of this. Uh, this is Andy Warhol, mm -hmm. he did a series of Marilyn Prince. This was probably the most popular with the blue, it's called Marilyn Blue Background. And I think about two years ago it was on auction and um, it was purchased at the highest ever for Andy Warhol, um, almost $200 million. Yeah. The Marilyn effect, you know, he did uh, Elizabeth Taylor, he did the Campbell Tomato Soup that's so famous around the world. No one approached anything that's come to auction for Marilyn. And then, I don't know if any of you remember this hoopla over Kim Kardashian wearing this gold Monday dress that Marilyn would, so you see the um, photo that Paul took out for us. Okay, that's Marilyn Monroe at John F. Kennedy's birthday. Remember Happy Birthday, Mr. President song? Okay, that, she had her st uh, studio wardrobe make her that dress very quickly because she wanted to go to his birthday party. And many, many years later, that dress resurfaced on Kim Kardashian, who is actually not that well known in Japan, but it made the evening news just because she was wearing Marilyn Monroe's dress. But even more amazing, this dress had been hiding in plain sight at a museum. Ripley's, believe it or not, had purchased this a few years ago for over $5 million. Just because of Marilyn Monroe, I think she wore it once. And you don't hear anything like that about Chris Kelly or, or Gargoyle. And it's, nothing comes close. And, and in the short time she had left in Hollywood, she wanted, um, so her voice coach had told her, just listen to Ella Fitzgerald. And if you go back and hear some of the Marilyn recordings, you really do hear that little bit of Ella in her. So next time you have a chance. Uh, but anyway, Ella was fairly well known and obviously well known enough that a voice coach would say just listen to Ella. But Marilyn just fell in love with her voice and she went back to the, the biggest club, nightclub uh, in Hollywood, in Los Angeles. 
and ask them to please book Ellen. And they said, well, Ellen's not quite big enough. Uh, it's been reported since that it might have been a race issue, but it wasn't because they had had um, black artists there. But the owner said, no, we're not really interested, but, but we'll consider it down the line. Well, she wouldn't give up, so she said, if you put Ella, if you book Ella, I will make sure you press and all my friends are there every single night. I said, okay, well, how can you say no to that? And do you know, Ella thanked her for the rest of her life. She said, I never had to, to play another gym bar in town because she was still playing good places, bad places. She didn't always get to the top of the range, even in New York. So she does um, attribute that to Marilyn. Okay, and then back to Joe and Marilyn. Well, their, their uh, relationship never did recover after that. They had um, one very sad incident. This was just after she declared um, she filed for divorce. But in those days, you needed a one-year legal separation before you were actually divorced, legally divorced. So after she filed, Joe was trying to find any fault on her part that they would have to go back to day one of the legal separation. So uh, Frank Sinatra, who had just been um, ditched by his wife at the time, Ava Gardner, said, oh, well, I've got a detective. He's really good. You know, he'll, he'll tell you everything that he's doing. So Joe said, I'm going to hire him. They're sitting in a restaurant. The detective says, you've got to come right away, because Marilyn just walked into a, a house with a, another man. Um, and so Joe and Frank Sinatra got in their cars with their hooligans. And they went to this house. The house was pointed out to them, so they kicked down the front door. Then they found the bedroom door and they kicked down the bedroom door. And they've got a photographer with them so they could find, you know, file the evidence that she was having an extra night to prepare. And then there's this, this poor middle-aged woman with curlers in her hair screaming. Of her, and it's called the wrong door raid. It was such a, a sad, sad ending, you know, to an already sad marriage that was falling apart. But Frank Sinatra had enough clout to keep it out of the papers for a while. But so many neighbors saw them. They saw Frank Sinatra and Joe DiMaggio kick back the door and go in. And so um, the, the woman eventually uh, took them to court and sued and got quite a bit of money. And um, that was the very end, I think, of any chance Joe had to get back to the Maryland, but. So, and as another added legacy, um, more attributable to Joe, but um, Maryland certainly helped it along when, uh, coming along with the trip um, in 54, was, do you, do you know Murakami Masanori? He was the first um, Japanese player in the American Major League. Yeah, and this year, I think, is the 60th year. 60th year of the and it was only made possible because America was funding talented athletes or scholars to go to the United States to study because none of them could afford it at the time of all the travel restrictions and the dollars still being 360 and it made it almost impossible. And so there were lots of scholarship made available and Joe and Lefty of course mentored a lot of these uh, young teams, farm team players. And um, so Murakami went and he was playing for a farm team out in San Jose. He was called up for a game um, with the San Francisco Giants. And he, he won. It was a, a come from behind him. He was a hero, immediate hero, and they wanted to sign him to the major league contract. So and he said, oh, but it wasn't just baseball. I just loved everything and anything about America. So he just had the time of his life. And that was all made possible by people like Joe and um, Lefty, They're setting up these foundations and, and basically building the bridges so that more and more young Japanese people could go and study and play in, in America. So I think that's the legacy. And like I said, if Marilyn had not met Joe or Mary Jo, it would have taken a very different path and who knows where it would have ended a year later. The same thing with baseball. I, I think if it wasn't for a lot of things that Lefty did, he worked particularly close with the Central League, but primarily through the League. And if it wasn't for people like Lefty, he just loved Japan and he came back quite frequently. 
uh, we might not have uh, the same kind of relationship uh, with the United States or between sports, or there may not be a Ichiro or uh, Tana, or it would have taken a very different path. So, okay, and then another legacy of Maryland. It's just all over the world. It's like, just a selection here. Quickly, this is uh, the dream house that Marilyn asked uh, Frank Lloyd Wright to design for her. And it was because she fell in love with the architecture of the, the Imperial Hotel. So immediately when she moved to New York, then she made overtures, she actually went and met Frank Lloyd Wright, and then she was involved with Arthur Miller. Arthur Miller didn't really like the design, and it was huge and it looked like a spaceship. Um, and he said, imagine the maintenance on this monstrosity, and you were living like, in, like the wooden part of Connecticut suburbs somewhere. So uh, Arthur said no, and that was the end of that. But many years later, again, fans, Japanese fans of Marilyn Monroe were going to start a new golf course in Hawaii, so they decided to go to Frank Lloyd Wright uh, office. By then, Frank Lloyd Wright was long dead, this is in the 80s, and the bubble years, and asked if, um, if they could use this as the clubhouse. So it became the clubhouse of a, of a club that is now known as Kamehameha. Of course, and, and the locals call it the Maryland House, and a lot of, lot of tourists go because it was what Maryland had asked Frank Lloyd Wright to design. So that's that very strong. <laughs> <laughs> so many of you recognize the father of Shiatsu. Okay, and you see what he started. It, um, Shiatsu is still like a new, um, new branch of Japanese massage and healing techniques, and he was the founder. Um, um, and he, um, he was respected, but he wasn't that famous. But when word leaked that he had been to Marilyn Monroe's suite in the Hill Hotel like six times to be dead, because she didn't want, she was taking so, so many um, vaccine shots and all sorts of things, and she had a condition called endometriosis, which is now much better understood. But it was just, just very painful, and also probably um, affected her reproductive organs. And so she was constantly in pain, but she didn't want to have painkillers constantly be shot painkillers. So she asked if there was a drug-free treatment somehow. And so the girl asked him along. And of course, he became not only famous all over Japan because of this encounter with her, but all around the world. So imagine how many students have now studied Chiatsu in all the colleges, right, of massage and whatever, all over Europe, all over Asia, America. And um, yeah, so she made him very famous, of course, and she made, she made uh, Chanel, <coughs> Chanel very famous. And of course, she's uh, synonymous with Playboy. And you know that he had hers very right next to her, bought a plot next to her many years ago. So, um, here you are. Okay, in filmography. So, here we have, see the last two that she did under the old contract? River will return, there's no business like show business. And then Seven Year Age was the last of that batch. Last stop, they produced Marilyn Monroe Productions. Uh, Prince and the Showgirl, she actually went out and it was a very hotly pursued property, the, the script. And everybody wanted to produce this movie, everybody wanted to star in it. And she actually managed to find the playwright, sit down for a meeting and, and win the contract. So she was being a very good producer too, when she set up the Marilyn um, Productions. Um, that was Prince and the Showgirl. Um, she did not get along with Lawrence and Olivia Conner. Some Like It Hot, which is, is often considered one of her best movies, if not the best, is constantly being voted uh, in the top ten comedies in Hollywood of all time. Okay, and let's make love in the mysteries. <coughs> That's it. She, she had quite a few years, but I think um, she was distracted by many other things. She started um, training method acting, and a lot of her, her fellow actors thought that it did, did not do very good things for her mental health. <coughs> they forced her to go through um, uh, psychoanalysis, which tapped, her, tapped into her way. It's 
probably different from the average person would respond. And uh, anyway, whatever the reason might be, uh, I think she suffered heavily from her, well, what turned into an acrimonious relationship with Arthur Miller as well. But I am not a biographer. I just wanted to give you a snapshot of where I think her trajectory into the superstardom started, and that was <coughs> marrying Joe and coming to Japan. So um, thank you uh, very much. And uh, I'd really uh, like to thank the organizers here. And I'm going to take questions now. I'd like, this has been a real pleasure. Thank you very much.
So one of the dinners that um, Joe uh, was invited to was the head, head of Chase Bank, I think, at the time. So he was the Asia Pacific president or something. Okay, uh, um, And they were invited to dinner, Marilyn went, went along. And Marilyn uh, didn't feel well, so the wife showed her to the guest room. And then, after about 20 minutes, went back to check on him. And they had a very good friend who lived just down the road, Dr. Charlie. And just down the road. But, but then the wife came back all flustered and she goes, well, I don't think it would be right to call the doctor because Marilyn refuses to wear a nightie. So apparently, when she went to check, Marilyn was stock naked on the bed. And when, when Mrs. Dove asked, uh, said, can I get it? John was in that issue. No, thank you. I never wear nighties to bed. And that was the end of that. So this woman, being a little bit prudish, um, went back and announced, no, we should not call on you with a good doctor because this is too embarrassing. And of course, the, the men around the table were snickering. And then the next day, when the doctor heard about it, he was livid. He said, You didn't call me because Marilyn Monroe was naked. Are you crazy? <laughs> Anyway, so yes, there, there was a lot of interaction and a lot of internal lefty, yeah? And then, of course, Yomiri entertained them lavishly, but I'm sure that was just polite conversation through an interpreter. It wouldn't have been the same for Joe. Joe wasn't a very sociable person. Um, he wasn't easy to get along with. But it was amazing, I think it was being the lefty that brought out the best in him.
Japanese foods while they were here, or if they um, enjoyed anything in particular. I, I heard that, yes, they've been to many Japanese restaurants, but I think, I think when they went with their yomiuri hosts, they were told not to, to go easy on sashimi and things. I, I don't think um, Joe to do that much. And by the sounds of it, um, when, when Lefty was on his own, he always went to the Western restaurants. He knew, maybe because he knew the owners and they spoke English. But no, I, I haven't heard of them. Does anybody else have any, you, I, I don't know, I should look it up, because now you have been curious. Because there are, are many photos of them attending the banquets, with the geisha girls and everything else, but... Um, Thank you. Oh, and you know, in Sicily, they do eat raw fish. It's one of the few parts of Italy that eats a lot of raw fish, and that's why their white wine goes very well with sashimi. But, you know, but, you know early 1950s, yeah. right after the war, I don't think Japanese were proud of Japanese food. Uh, okay. So I don't think it's going to be, you know, it was not public, yeah. public widely. Yeah. Uh, I hear the same thing in Korea. You know, the, the Korean people didn't really, uh, was not proud of the Korean food until, you know, just uh, 20, 20, 30 years ago. Yeah. So I think those things happen. You know? yeah. But I, I, I'm sure they had a lot of Japanese food. <laughs> no, thank you. I'll look for them. Thank you for your nice lecture. Uh, you showed us a picture of Masao Kashiki. Yes. Uh, he was here, uh, student of University of Tokyo in those days. He yes. had a bag. Yes. So, uh, it's possible <laughs> I'd like to uh, know uh, more detail uh, of the background in Japanese. Oh, in Japanese, sure. I know what does she must know the Kagi to you are, and which called the Kachan. Hi, it's called. And so I told you, you know, it's called a ma, so no more. It's called a today. You can tell the ま、ここみたいな。ですから、今あの、YCSとなんじゅうねんか1回に、またその試合をやってるんですね。でもその時はやはりあの、地区ってありませんから、東大のチームが来てます。How did you uh, find this local woman here in Kawana who had met Joe and Marilyn locally? What was the process? Two of my good mentors and spies on the ground. No, I should have. Yeah. Actually, um, I just asked you know, because this picture is quite famous. Um, it was taken by somebody who was there with them on that day, and then you know, distributed quite freely, so it appears on, on many articles about their honeymoon. And then I just said, is there any possibility I can talk to any of them? And um, yeah, he was like, so okay, so incredibly, and for the coming of lots of memories. And so several people in this room, I think, know he was like, you know, that was could you tell us a little bit about her early life? How did she end up doing nude photos? Uh, well, how early is early? She was doing nude photos, I think, when she was really trying to break into films. Um, so she calls it her poor modeling days. So uh, actually, even two years before Playboy came out, she'd already done her rounds of explaining to Hollywood media that she was very poor and she did it for very little uh, money of you. And uh, I guess Hugh Hefner was just lucky to buy a phone or something because they'd already circulated his calendars for many years. And it was sort of known because it was Marilyn. <laughs> she, she used the first name Marilyn and various last names, but it came out and then she came clean and she said, oh, God, I saw on you, it was just to be the end. And it, what's amazing is this is supposed to be pretty 
British case called Era America. And actually, it turns out they weren't so British at all. That's the surprise of the McKinsey report, you know, the, uh, the sexual habits of Americans. Well, I think the biggest shock was that it took so long for people to realize that a lot of people were not virgins when they're not married in this. But it was shocking at the time. The report was considered shocking. And yet, nothing Marilyn did seemed to shock her friends away from going to her movies. So she had that effect as well. It was a combination, I guess. But, you know, she, that's her, what she called her young, hungry, modern days. And she got nothing from labeling. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, we are talking about the Playboy. There was a big, big black stain. Yes. You know, from what happened? Somebody, somebody put a black stain on me. Can you imagine? But, but, but you know. Oh, the four pictures? No. Oh, with the stain. Oh, what are you talking about? Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, I missed it. I heard that uh, Mary doing a uh, very long goes uh, impersonation. She can sing uh, Happy Birthday, you know, she sang to uh, uh, President Kennedy. Can you, can you do that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. By the way, my birthday is coming, but coming <laughs> in May. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon. Hi. Hi. 
Hello, uh, I'm from the Philippines that, uh, you know, Marilyn Monroe, when I, uh, when I was born, I think I, I thought she's not that, uh, I'm not familiar with her, but then, uh, now I know because you thought a lot of things about Marilyn Monroe. No, and thank you very much for it. No, well, thank you. I, I hope you see a movie or two. I mean, she really is an incredibly talented actress. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your lecture. It was very uh, insightful. I was wondering if other celebrities came to Japan after her and followed her model and you know popularized Japan in a different way. You know, I can't, um, because it was a two-way thing with Marilyn that made it extra special. Uh, but um, uh, Audrey Hepburn is also, like, even 60 years on, um, she's, she's an icon. And long ago when calendar sales and, um, what do you call it, jigsaw puzzles? So Marilyn and, and Audrey were competing for 50 years. And I don't think that's one of the favorite hobbies in Japan anymore, but yeah, they were always very, very popular. <laughs> hmm. You know, I, I always compare the Marilyn effect to um, Princess Diana. So in that respect, oh, well, Japan fell in love with her, and of course, the, the whole world press covers every step of every tour that she went on, so it would have been incredible publicity for Japan. And what an ambassador she was for all British friends and culture and everything. Right? So she's the only one I think that remotely compares to the fact that I think Marilyn had. Not to your script, not yet. Um, but you know, you can't compete with social media, 300 million followers. She can sell anything. Oh, but we can go to Pearls, too. Uh, undisclosed sun, they, they bought that, that string for millions of dollars. Yeah. Anything she's associated with, seven years on. So, really interesting moment. You know, it's a business case study, really. I, I think I'm going to write to the Washington Times on a post. It's a very long, wrong to compare them yet. She might have done, and does it match the timeline? 
The timeline is very important because often it just disproves the theory before you move into it. Um, I suspect that didn't happen because she was um, very, it was very fraught production. And her business partner from New York was there, Milton Green, and along with her husband, Arthur Miller. And things were not going well, I don't think, between all of them, Lawrence and Olivier. So I don't know when she would have had the time. You know, they were going um, over and on cost and time and everything. So I don't know. And I've read other articles that said it could have happened. So it's a young boy's fantasy. They, you know, they might have had one afternoon dream or something. But I think you could stretch that as well as. You know, I, I've spent a couple of hours with, um, with very famous men. You know what that sounds. <laughs> you know, in different capacities in work and whatnot. And I could, I could write a book about, you know, and nobody could disprove it really. You know, the guy's dead, and uh, yeah. So I, I'm inclined not to believe that storyline, but I don't know. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. I didn't add much to. Oh, well, I'm, I'm going down a little, you know, low. Uh, I hear that uh, Marilyn has been uh, appeared with uh, John F. Kennedy and also Robert Kennedy. Do you think that's true? Career-wise, it was a pretty decent movie, and if you go online, you can see 
for pretty much the whole movie. It was almost complete. And um, it's not a bad movie. And she actually looks great. So, um, What's the name? Oh, the What is the name? Misfits? No, no, Misfits was the last movie she completed. And then, oh, something's got to give. See, I told you, I'm not a biographer, so if it's not in my timeline, in this story, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I know, something's got to give. She, she's uh, assumed to have been dead because she got you know, stranded on an island. And then she comes back and finds out her husband's been married. And anyway, it's a comedy, and, and I thought it was a great movie. Well, um, no, whether it's that, and I say that it's not a, it's bad for golfing, but it's a good, good day to be in you know, such a nice place, listening to a very nice presentation. Very thank you, thank you. very much. You, Larry, Paul, where would I be without you guys? And Fred, and Ms. Amitsan, and I have so many people to thank, but thank you so very much for coming today. I really enjoyed it. And your questions. Thank you. Hello, everyone, the old fashioned ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon.
thanks to Mary San and all of the guests and the Kawana Hotel. The lecture was quite successful and fruitful. And uh, thank you again. And furthermore, thank you uh, for your attention to my poor closing address in uh, smattering English. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.